Stan Gibalisco here, continuing our little tutorial in regards to the book Beginner's Guide to Reading Schematics. <clears throat> you can find all of the videos for this sequence in a playlist on my YouTube channel entitled Beginner's Schematics. This is the third edition published by McGraw-Hill in October 2013, edited by me, the previous editions done by Traster and Lisk. This new edition has some advancements and enhancements, including a spiral binding so it'll lay flat on your workbench. The paper-bound book has good heavy stock so it'll last a long time. Has no battery. Requires no boot up. Acquires no bugs nor viruses. And if you spill your Diet Mountain Dew on it, all it will get is wet. But I'd like to go to page 81 um, and look at the schematic diagram <clears throat> of a full wave bridge rectifier power supply. And it shows here, this is figure 4-22. There's a little blurb down here called Follow the Flow, which explains how the currents flow through here. This is a bridge rectifier. If you've been watching all of these videos, you will recall that I made a couple of videos explaining in some detail exactly how the bridge rectifier uses four diodes to produce pulsating direct current from alternating current input. Now this particular power supply has 120 volts AC at 60 hertz input, typical of the United States what you get out of your wall outlets in the United States. <clears throat> and it's designed to produce 12 volts DC. So that has to be a step down transformer right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just actually draw this diagram. Note the quadrille paper I've expounded. I seem to get frogs in my throat an awful lot these days. It's, I don't think I've got any allergies or anything like that. I think I'm just getting old. <clears throat> Crotchety old man. Now this <clears throat> diagram on page 81 in the book shows the same number of loops in the primary as we get in the secondary, but obviously this has to be a step down transformer. Now the AC comes into here flows back and forth in this primary winding laminated iron core secondary winding has fewer turns 120 volts now this isn't exactly 12 volts AC we're going to get 12 volts DC out of the supply but that doesn't necessarily mean that we want 12 volts AC here. <clears throat> in any case, um, the RMS voltage and the peak voltage are going to be uh, considerably different. But what we have then here is this bridge rectifier. That's four diodes and note the way that they're connected, the polarities. That's very important that you pay attention to that and you get all of these diodes connected in the proper polarity. If you connect any of them backwards, you're not going to end up with a full wave uh, power supply. You're going to end up with something else. Maybe even burned out diodes. I don't know. I guess it depends on what kind of a mistake you make. But there's where the inputs go. The cathodes all point basically to the right. <clears throat> So, in every case here, the anode is more to the left and the cathode is more to the right. Now, this particular um, connection is the negative pole, which goes straight to ground. This isn't exactly the same geometrical configuration as the diagram that I have uh, put into the book. It, but it is the same circuit. I mean, I'm just rearranging some of the symbols a little bit, but they're, they're all interconnected in the same electrical way. 
It's just a little bit of a geometrical difference. Now, so what we get here is pulsating direct current right there. However, we want pure direct current at the output here. We don't want pulsating direct current. Negative ground, positive terminal, like that. <clears throat> Chassis ground symbols right here. Presumably this supply is built on a, an aluminum chassis. If it's not, uh, if it's on a circuit board, then you would have foil runs probably going around the outside of the circuit board that would all represent this chassis ground. That is a filter choke. Very large value inductor. Probably on the order of one Henry, maybe even more than that. Then we have a couple of electrolytic capacitors of high value, hundreds of microfarads most likely. Note the polarities. You've got to connect these things up right. And when you have, let's just say they're 470 microfarads each. And let's say this is a 1.5 Henry filter choke. Big old sucker. Those things, if you remember those, if you're old enough to remember those high voltage power supplies, I remember one of those filter chokes that came in what looked like a can. It looked like a big old can. It was about the size of this thing. Reese's quartered artichoke hearts. Oh boy. On a salad, nothing like those. But that, this was a, and this thing was heavy. It was heavier than a full can of that, that's for sure. And, and that thing had a coil that was uh, emolded in epoxy. It was really quite, a, quite something, quite something. A lot of uses for those besides uh, power supply filters, incidentally. Looks like I dripped a little bit of water there from my Reese's quartered artichoke hearts onto the quadrille paper. Just a little, uh, little special effect for you here. So what we have here is a full wave power supply. Now these uh, capacitors in conjunction with this filter choke get rid of the ripple. The pulsating direct current becomes pure direct current. These capacitors, you need to make sure to have them rated at enough voltage to withstand uh, what they're going to be getting here. I'd recommend 35 volt electrolytics for a 12 volt supply. I mean, do a little bit of over engineering on one of these because last thing you want is for an electrolytic capacitor to blow up in your face. I, del I have deliberately sabotaged electrolytics to see how violent their explosions would be, and by golly, they are violent. You can get hurt from blowing up one of these, so don't. And make sure you connect the polarity properly, too. So these capacitors tend to hold the charge and smooth out that ripple by holding those peaks and not letting them drop. If you load down this supply way too much, though, this filter is going to start having trouble because these capacitors are going to discharge more and more quickly and you may get some ripple unless you'd have to make bigger have to put in bigger capacitors and this filter choke it literally it's like a uh, a choke is like a low pass filter in fact that's what this whole thing is this is what you call a pi network a pi network. Why do we call it a pi network? Because the components are arranged sort of like an uppercase or even a lowercase Greek letter pi like that. Pi network. And so the it acts like a very very strict low pass filter with a cutoff frequency way 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 below the ripple frequency which is 120 hertz remember coming out of here twice the AC line frequency if you happen to live in a country where it's 50 hertz AC line frequency you would get a 
uh, pulsating direct current at 100 hertz. But this, the cutoff frequency of this thing is like maybe 5 hertz. It is really low, really low. You can actually calculate, if you care to, using the formula for the resonant frequency of a tuned circuit. You could, if, if you want, you can actually calculate that and email, and email me and tell me what it is. Just for fun. Just a little exercise. I'm not going to bother. I've already yammered at you for almost uh, 11 minutes. Stan Jabalisco from the Black Hills of Dakota Territory, United States of America, where the temperature tomorrow night is supposed to get down to 15 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. And if you want a little exercise, <clears throat> you can calculate the Celsius equivalent of that. If you live in one of these countries where it never snows, oh boy, <laughs> oh, you'd love it. You'd love it. Until next time, have fun. Enjoy the book, Beginner's Guide to Reading Schematics, and, by the way, to drawing them. So long.